back here with you on the Alex Jones Show. And, of course, I'm Kate Daly from katedalyradio.com. Um, let, let me just start here with this segment, because I know I'll tick some people off. I usually offend somebody. Don't worry. I'll get to you. <laughs> I haven't offended you yet. Um, you know, we had two world wars. The CIA got a hold of the media. We knew this, right? Um, or some people knew this. I think a lot of people were kind of just trying to run their families and, and uh, work hard and raise kids. If that wasn't hard enough, we've had government lie after government lie. But once they took Kennedy out, I think when we didn't, uh, as a populace, now 60% of America doesn't believe um, the, the official story. I mean, a lot of times we're, we're looking at the official story and America's not buying it. And that should tell you volumes that a lot of Americans are thinking like most people do. Wait a minute, there's some holes in that story. But what's interesting is, is now that the CIA owns the media, the field is really wide open to make the lies even bigger because they can. They can and they can get away with it. And that's what's sad. And this is why we need to wake people up. And I hate the term wake people up. I think it's so overused. But the problem is, is that there are a, a, a considerable amount of people that are still asleep and do not realize they put all their faith in government. I put my faith in God. Um, I've got a pretty, pretty good conviction on that one. Um, but they have a good conviction that government's going to run in and save them, even though history does not back them up. Okay? And so when we went to the moon, and I mean it was impossible to do that in the 1960s. You remember the 1960s, right? We had rabbit ears on our TV sets. We had, I, I was uh, in the 70s, I was the baby of the family, and I was in charge of being, being the remote control for my family. Um, of course, you know, I was the little one, so I always got sent to turn the TV knob, you know? And so in this time, they said that we had to win this war with Russia. There was a war with Russia in, in, in uh, technology, and, te and I don't even think Russia had that technology, but that's another story. We'll get to that in just a moment. But they went to the moon in a foil-wrapped tin can in unpressurized spacesuits in a time when we really had zero technology at that point to do something like that, to pull that off. The only distance that we had traveled to by 1969 was 400 miles in space and back. A year and a half before the moon launch, we burned uh, to death three astronauts in a capsule just in a single mishap that I think could have been avoided. But we flew 239,000 miles to the unknown, to the moon, and were able to not only walk on the moon, but then uh, we did it on a single tank of gas in an unshielded spaceship and then flew 234,000 miles back. Then there was the uh, main ship giving birth to the lunar module. Dave McGowan has wonderful things on this, Center for Informed uh, Citizen. And uh, he's done, so he did some great research, research before his death. And that untested lunar module then flying down, making a perfect landing on the surface of the moon. And then there was the same untested lunar module blasting off from the surface of the moon without the assistance of any ground crew and ascended 69 miles to attain lunar orbit. Then there was the ever reliable lunar module finding, catching and docking with another ship while in lunar orbit, utilizing yet more untested technology. Then there was the command module shedding the lunar module and then commencing the 239,000 miles home, right? And we did it with a combination of lethal space radiation, lethal temperatures, a complete lack of breathable air, and lower gravitational attraction that produces serious health problems, okay, and is not compatible with human existence. And then uh, we did not have the rocket technology to power such a mission or the navigation system to guide a journey or the digital computer technology to control the navigation system, nor did we have the spacesuit technology to protect the astronauts. Did I mention they were unpressurized? Okay. Ah, so major, or, or I should say project manager Thomas Kelly uh, concurred, noting that, and he was project manager for Apollo 11, the skin, the aluminum alloy skin of the crew compartment was about 12 one thousandths of an, of an inch thick. That's equivalent to three layers of Reynolds wrap that you could use in the kitchen. That was what was protecting our astronauts on the way to the moon and back. And Apollo 11 computer engineer Jack Garman said the computer screens that we looked at at Mission Control, well, they weren't exactly computer screens at all. They were televisions. All the letters, the characters, they were actually hand-drawn. 
I don't necessarily mean with a brush, he said, but I mean that they were painted on a slide. But they sure looked impressive. Every one of those consoles on the floor of that, uh, of, of, uh, that just, it was absolutely ridiculous because it really wasn't doing what everybody thought it was doing. It just looked super good. So essentially, says Dave McGowan, essentially an oversized Jiffy Pop container with the brain power of a digital watch. And it went off without a hitch and returned without a hitch. Never have launched from an extraterrestrial location before. And we broadcasted it live on TV and nailed it because we did it right on Sunday night at 9 o'clock when everyone could be glued to the TV at just the right moment. Wow, the odds. Um, oh, and every single bit of evidence and tape and documents about the moon landing were actually lost. Not 100 cartons, not 50 cartons, all 700 cartons. Okay. Gee, you know... I think, you know, we're actually really good at preserving things. We preserve Judy Garland's shoes from Wizard of Oz, but we don't preserve a single carton of evidence that we actually went to the moon. Gone forever, right? Not a shred of documentation. But because of nostalgia and emotion, we're never allowed to talk about this, or you're a Looney Tune. I don't know, I just can't ignore the fact that looking back in the 60s, we were able to do all of this, yet can't pull it off in the year 2022. In 2009, all they had to do was crash something into the surface of the moon so they could get some test studies to see if there were water in the craters, and they couldn't even do that. Guess what? The photo footage? <laughs> um, some, something went wrong, some sort of mishap, and um, yes, in the year 2009, and we couldn't even get that. It was supposed to broadcast live. But we broadcasted live in a time with rabbit ears rabbit ears and no computers, when it took an entire room to house one single computer, we sent them up in a little tiny tin can. Okay, so was the entire thing about, Russia, about beating Russia? Well, yes, but why? Was Russia actually even that close to going to space? Was they, were they as close as we thought they were? Or did we fabricate that to find a reason to why we had to be challenged, right? And then come out a winner. We needed a win at that point, desperately. Was the Cold War a cover for giving Russia technology? Did they have about the same technology we did? It wasn't much. And were we really having a Cold War with Russia? Or were they just the named enemy at the time? Hmm. And if they were a mortal enemy, why did we sign a treaty with them for the Antarctica right in the middle of the Cold War? Seems a little strange, right? That right smack in the middle of that, 12 nations got together and we agreed on a treaty for a continent that no one will be able to go and visit. It seems kind of strange. I thought they were our enemy. Hmm. And Russia and the US have the only bioweapons labs that has smallpox, interestingly enough. We share a lot of things. But I'm going to come right back and talk a little bit more about that because there's, I think there's a lot more to the Russia narrative and Russia story than we realize. But I've got a lot on this, so we'll come back. But we really need to think in concrete terms about what we're told every single day by the media. Well, I mean the government. I mean the media. I mean the government. Be right back. Kate Daly, your guest host. Welcome back. I'm Kate Daly, your guest host on The Alex Jones Show today. And just kind of going back and maybe connecting some dots with Russia, with us right now, because Russia seems to be the big ooh, boogeyman. Um, but uh, was the Cold War a cover for giving Russia technology? I'll explain that in just a moment, um, because there is some evidence that that's exactly what we were doing. And why did we go and sign a treaty, a treaty in the Antarctica with Russia if Russia was our mortal enemy right smack during the Cold War? It just doesn't really make sense, does it? You kind of have to ask yourself these questions. And so why does, uh, well, let me, let me put it this way. Was Russia told to play a part in taking Ukraine back? Is that why they aren't using the firepower on their own people of Ukraine? I mean, it could be that they don't want to kill their own people in Ukraine, and that's why uh, the media is really struggling with the body count, because there isn't a severe body count. They would love for there to be a severe body count, but none of the stories are really shaking true. None of the things that the media is reporting about the whole Ukraine situation is really coming to be true, okay? 
when they say they kill, you know, in a hospital, they, you know, 3,000 babies are in a hospital. Have you ever seen a hospital with 3,000 babies? Yeah. Anyway, um, but I think there's so much more to that story that's not being told. But isn't it also very, very interesting that King Fraudalot announced this week that Russia was going, going to implement a cyber attack on us? Uh-oh. I mean, why us? If you think about it, why would they be attacking us? Because the whole narrative so far has been Biden, uh, King Fraudalot, saying that uh, we're not involved over there. We don't have bioweapons labs. We're not, we're not really even involved. We're just watching, okay? We didn't coup them in 2014. Of course not. So then why would Russia want to implement a cyber attack on us? Aren't they at war with Ukraine? Doesn't make sense. Their narratives are crashing into each other at the intersection of Bullshiz Street and Crock of Crap Avenue is really what's going on here. And I hope the American people are seeing it and asking all the right questions. They keep telling us they didn't coup Ukraine, but oddly enough, Russia wants to cyber attack us. Doesn't make sense. But yet his intel tells him that this is what's going to happen. So they're busy making plans. No, the only thing they're planning to do is to set off a false flag and blame Russia. Okay? And Russia did not have a seat at the table like they usually do. Think about that. China and Russia usually always have a seat at the table for everything, but they didn't have a seat at the table for the banking failure drill that happened four months ago. So was that to foment the crazy blame game for shortages and high prices? Of course it was. And then bring us into digital currency with the bank failure that's coming. The same digital currency that through the executive order that uh, King Fraudalot signed. Okay. And so what if we played up the Russian space program to invent a race between the countries? Let's go back to the space program for a moment and let's go back into a little bit of history courtesy of uh, Mr. Fagan. One branch of the Rothschilds family had financed Napoleon. The other branch of the Rothschilds family financed Britain, Germany, and the other nations in the Napoleonic Wars. And immediately after the Napoleonic Wars, the Illuminati, um, you know, that entity that liberals think only existed for a couple of years way back when in history, assumed that all the nations were so destitute and so weary of wars that they'd be so glad for any solution. So the Rothschild uh, stooges set up what they called the Congress in Vienna. And at that meeting, they tried to create the first League of Nations, but their first attempted world war, uh, world government, one world government, on the theory that all crowned heads of European governments were so deeply in debt to them that they would willingly or unwillingly serve as their stooges. So the Tsar of Russia caught this plot and completely torpedoed it. And of course, Nathan Rothschild's very angry, then the head of the dynasty vowed that someday he and his descendants would destroy the Tsar and his entire family, and his descendants did accomplish that in 1917. But a lot has happened since 1917, especially with Russia and especially with technology. While Karl, Karl, uh, Karl Marx was writing the Communist Manifesto, and this is again Fagan, under the direction of the one group of Illuminists, right? Professor Karl Ritter of Frankfurt University was writing uh, the antithesis under the direction of another group. And the idea was that uh, who directs the overall conspiracy, if you will, all of these well-laid plans, could use the differences in the two so-called ideologies to enable them to divide larger and larger numbers of the human race into opposing camps so they could be armed and then brainwashed into fighting and destroying each other. I think that's what's happening now. <laughs> hmm. And destroy all political and religious institutions. What would they like to do? That's right. Go into a one world religion, and of course, a new world order. By the way, King Fraudalot talked about that new world order this week and said, yeah, that new world order uh, that's coming, we need to get everybody on board for that. But I thought that was a conspiracy. Oh, just, you know, all the presidents have said it. Must be a conspiracy. Okay, so they absolutely sat down to write and, and to think out and to, and to um, really implement communism because then communism would be used as a weapon of war right and a weapon of fear and not to say communism was good obviously it wasn't but they actually implemented invented uh what it was and how it would be utilized to then have 
the sort of blame game, fear game going on where we would always have an enemy. We would always have something that we needed to beat or needed to um, go to war with, right? Isn't that how it works? So according to John Rappaport, I love my friend John because he always puts out some of the greatest stuff. And he talked about in 1927, Standard Oil of New York Rockefeller built a refinery in Russia. Huh thereby helping the Bolsheviks put their economy back on their feet, right? So Professor uh, Anthony Sutton said this was the first United States investment in Russia since the revolution. Shortly thereafter, Standard Oil of New York and its subsidiary, Vacuum Oil, concluded a deal to market Soviet oil in European countries, and it was reported that the loan of $75 million to the Bolsheviks was arranged. So wherever uh, Standard Oil would go, Chase National Bank was sure to follow. Love Chase. The Rockefellers Chase Bank was later merged with the Warburg's Manhattan Bank to form the present Chase Manhattan Bank. And in order to rescue the Bolsheviks, we were supposedly an arch enemy of, the Chase National Bank was instrumental in establishing the American-Russian Chamber of Commerce in 1922. The Rockefellers Chase National Bank was also involved in selling Bolshevik bonds in the United States in 1928. And the Soviet government had been given United States Treasury funds by the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, of course, again, acting through Chase Bank. Hmm. But the Rockefellers apparently were not alone in financing the communist arm of this conspiracy. And a conspiracy is a well-laid plan. Boy, they have a lot of them. According to Professor Sutton, there's a report in the State Department file that names Kuhn Loeb and Company, the long-established, important financial house in New York, as the financier of the Russians' first five-year plan. And you can see the U.S. State Department decimal file on that. Hmm. Why would the Rockefellers and Armand Hammer and others take the lead in such a covert transfer program over the course of decades? Well, money and profits on one level. Isn't that always how it works? And on another level, bolstering the Russian communist socialist state was part of their plan, the Rockefeller plan to expand socialism in many forms all across the countries all over the world. It's always funny to me that people can read the Bible, read the book of Revelations, especially Christians, and then try to mock conspiracy theorists for saying this is the direction we're going in. How do we get from here to there? How do we get from here to there without all of that taking place? Do they think it takes place in a day? You know, it's so funny to me that we can't recognize that major conspiracies and plans have been laid and set since the dawn of time. And especially as Christians out there should realize that we should be the ones that really get it. But isn't it odd and funny that you actually uh, get the mocking a lot from, from Christians? And so do they believe the book or not? It's always a question. Anyway, I'll be right back. I'm Kay Daly, your guest host. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm Kate Daly, your guest host from katedalyradio.com. You know, tying all of this together, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? When you look at, uh, at some really well-laid plans to involve Russia in many, many plans and types of funding and banks and everything else that we were doing all along in, during the supposed Cold War as well. But I thought a Cold War meant we were at war really right yeah not so much anyway why would the rockefellers arm and haber and others take the lead in this covert transfer program right over the course of the decades you've got money you've got profits okay uh says john rapaport but on another level bolstering the russian communist socialist state was really what they were all well that's what they were after You've got to have the enemy. It doesn't mean the enemy doesn't exist. It means that you create the enemy, you conjure up the enemy, and the enemy does what the enemy does. But we wanted to use that enemy as really kind of like a weapon of war. So you're supp we're supplying Russia with all of this vital technology that it lacked, and that eventually produced the Cold War. And that mighty standoff really was this gigantic moneymaker 
for the banksters. And it also created a threat to Europe, which justified the rise of dun, 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 European Union. Yeah. See, they would love to regionalize all of us. They'd love for us in, in North America, uh, Canada and uh, uh, Mexico to be a region too. They'd like to have six, basically six regions instead of the sovereignty of nations. So the European uh, Union, um, that really gave rise at that point, uh, was more of the causation or the catalyst for the European Union to come about. So the individual states, countries would then lose their sovereignty to the decision maker called the European Union. It's kind of like a little test run for one world order. And another major Rockefeller CFR Bilderberg plan was to extend this covert agenda into the socialism globalism and the EU is the regional face of globalism. This is why it's so loved. They love it. And in Korea, we have direct killing of Americans, right, with Soviet weapons. And the American casualty rule in the Korean War was 33,000 killed, 103,000 wounded, and 130,000 man North Korean army, which crossed the South Korean border in June of 1950, was trained, supported, and equipped by Soviet Union, and included a brigade of Soviet T-34, T sorry, uh, medium tanks, hmm. with U.S. Christie suspensions. The artillery tractors were direct metric copies of the Caterpillar tractors that we have here. The trucks came from Henry Ford Gorky plant or the ZIL plant. The North Korean Air Force had 183 Yak planes built in plants with U.S. Lend Lease equipment. Hmm. Seems cozy, does it not? I just get the cozies when, I, when I'm reading this. The Yaks were later replaced by MIG 15s powered by the Russian copies of the Rolls-Royce jet engines sold to the Soviet Union in 1947. Who were the government officials responsible for this transfer of known military technology? The concept originally came from National Security Advisor, who's 200 years old, Henry Kissinger. Still alive, still kicking, still with us. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, who reportedly sold President Nixon on the idea that giving military technology to the Soviets would temper their global territorial ambitions. Hmm. And not least uh, that Henry had been paid a paid family employee of the Rockefellers since 1958 and has served as the International Advisory Committee Chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank, a Rockefeller concern, our biggest liaison to China, and also every single president that's ever run for office needs to get his permission. That's fun. Anyway, the Arm and & Hammer and Occidental Petroleum would supply the Soviets with massive plants that can quickly be converted to explosive uh, manufacturing. Well, that's no surprise. And Soviet tractor plants were established in the early 30s with major U.S. technical and equipment assistance. Hmm. The Stalingrad tractor plant was completely built in the United States, shipped to Stalingrad, and then installed in prefabricated steel buildings also purchased in the United States. So sure, let's have a Cold War with Russia. Then elite U.S. corporations and financiers can supply Russia with the updated weapons under the table and create an even bigger enemy and bigger race wars and everything else. And when I, when I say race wars, I meant the space war. It was the uh, space war with Russia that got everybody enticed and very, very eager to do something that was, well, virtually impossible. Still is, apparently, because we don't go back ever.